I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. We are in for a treat today. Headspace founder Andy Puttacombe is on the show. Headspace is a meditation app, and Annie's voice is what you hear each time you use the app. If you've listened to the show before, you've heard me rave about Headspace and the role it's played in my life. Andy has quite the story. He was a Buddhist monk, and he has a degree in circus arts, as you do. (laughs) Quite the combo. And now Andy has a fast-growing health and technology company called Headspace, And there are more than 10 million users now on Headspace. Whether you've never meditated before or you do it every day, I think you'll find Annie's point of view valuable and refreshing. Before we get started, I want to tell you about my partners at Design Pickle. You know when you're in a pickle because you need a design, but you don't have the time or maybe even the skill to do it yourself. Many of us have been there. Design Pickle has been a lifesaver for me. Here's how they're set up. You pay a flat rate monthly fee and you're given a dedicated designer for all of your needs. You heard that right. Unlimited graphic designs, unlimited requests, and the first 14 days are risk-free. You get a full refund if you cancel in the first two weeks. Why not now listeners like yourself get 30% off their first month at Design Pickle? You can go to designpickle.com forward slash why not now to redeem the offer. For me, the process has been painless and ego-free. In fact, many of the posts you're seeing on my social media channels were created by my buddies at Design Pickle, specifically Jacob at Design Pickle. That's what's cool is that you get a dedicated designer. I'm on a first name basis with my designer. A mentor once said to me, just because you can doesn't always mean you should. Do what you're uniquely qualified to do. Design Pickle helps me do just that. Go to designpickle.com forward slash why not now to redeem the offer. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery. Yep, the original before you go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you know what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit poopery.com and why not now listeners get 20% off with code why not now. That's all one word. Also, you can now get Poopery at Bed Bath and Beyond. Andy, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Very good. Thanks, Amy Jo. And yeah, thanks for having thanks for having me on today. Oh, absolutely. This is quite exciting for me because um, I am hearing your voice live and we actually get to interact and usually I'm hearing your voice in the app. So this is a moment. <laughs> well, it's nice for me there's a conversation. Well. I don't like talking all the time, so I'm happy it's a, it's a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> to get that interaction, I'm sure that's great. Well, let's hop right in and talk about your why not now kind of philosophy and moments. Can you think of a time when you had that critical moment and you had to just ask yourself, why not now? Let's talk it through. 
Yeah, you know, so we were, you know, we were just chatting, chatting off offline, Amy Joe, and I was saying, you know, you, you sent this this question. This was the one question that you sent uh, ahead of our our chat today, and it was, you know, can I can I think of a time where I, you know, been wanting to do something for a long time, and I thought, why not now? And I couldn't think of anything. I genuinely couldn't think of anything. And I, I had to go, I went home and I asked my wife and I, I said, like, you know, are the things that you think that in the past, you know, that I've always wanted to do and I haven't done? And she was like, well, no, kind of, you just do them. And so I, I asked some friends as well. And as I look back over, over my life, I kind of realized that, and I don't know if this is, <laughs> this is a good thing or a, or a bad thing, you know, I kind of, once I, I have an idea, I tend to just kind of do it and, and not, sort of think about it too too much you know and that applied equally to kind of the smaller things in life but also kind of the bigger things in life so there were definitely decisions that I've made in my past which were kind of fairly sort of bold I suppose and and there was a, a case of yeah why not why not now um but they weren't necessarily things that I'd been wanting to do for a long time and I've been I've been putting off there are definitely some of those that apply now for the future but in terms of kind of the past um, more often than not, when I've when I've really wanted to do something, I've just I've just <laughs> gone ahead and done it. it. Kind of jumped in. It sounds like well, well, let's. Well, this is this is great uh, practice and exercise for for us to kind of listen and learn from. When you when you have something in your head and you just decide to do it, where do you think that comes from? Is it just your personality? Is it is it that you've seen this works really well for you, and so it's just become a practice? Um, do you, have you thought more about that? Is it just part of your DNA? I have, yeah, I, I have thought about it. It's interesting because I can kind of see it from from two sides. I think definitely having trained as a having trained as a Buddhist monk and having spent a lot of time um, sort of stepping out of all the inner chatter that often tends to cloud our vision and often tends to kind of get in the way of of actually acting upon something. Um, I think definitely that's helped in just trusting whether we call it kind of gut feel or intuition. I think that's made a, a big difference. But even kind of prior to that, I, I had quite a kind of, I don't know, a cheeky kind of all or nothing kind of personality, character, whatever, growing up. And I, I'd seen my I'd seen my mum in particular. You know, she, she worked for herself and I saw her set up companies and just try stuff, you know, which at the time... You know, I think back what we're trying to do with meditation now, I, I think back to sort of the, the 70s and grow, growing up in a little village, my mom and jogging had just become popular in America. I think there were maybe like a handful of people doing it in England. And I remember going out jogging with my mom as a, as a four or five year old and going through the village and just, you know, people kind of laughing at her what she was doing. But that was kind of her DNA as well, which was just to, just to try stuff and to kind of not really care too much what other people think about it. And I think I probably inherited quite a bit of that from my mum. That's I think that explains a lot, really. When kind of digging in, it it makes a lot of sense that you're kind of following, and that's what you grew up around. And as it relates to meditation, I've thought a lot about this recently. And this is the first time uh, I have ever consistently meditated and it's it's funny I think back when you said jogging had just become popular I remember trying this before yoga and before yoga mats because I took a towel out to my backyard and now I wouldn't would have taken a yoga mat but and a kitchen timer and I remember just hearing you know this is really good for um for focus and ideas and and you can really benefit a lot from this but I didn't really know the science behind it and I would try and that kitchen timer wouldn't even make it I couldn't even do five minutes it was just the hardest thing and no wonder now having more guidance you know through actually someone explaining to you uh, it's it's amazing to kind of see how much uh, the consistency and the the science behind it has been a big part of um, the benefit I've seen. So I think it, it took learning some more of the numbers and kind of at that macro level. So you've talked before about some of the, the statistics and our minds are lost in thought. Is it 40% of the time? 
Yeah, I mean the the, the study that um, it was a study. I think I I think I, it was one that I quoted in in the, the TED talk that we did, and um, it was a, it was actually a Harvard study. It wasn't our own study, and it was study. It's probably about five six years old now. But yeah, they they found that on average our minds are lost in thought. It's around forty seven percent of the time. So almost half of our life we are lost in thought, and that's kind of scary enough in itself. But the it was more the conclusion that that they found in. In, in the study, and they, they summarized it like this, saying that it's not just that we're lost in thought, it's that the, the more we allow our minds to wander, as a general rule, the more unhappy we tend to be. So we might kind of think of mind wandering as a, as a pleasant experience, we might associate it sort of with daydreaming or something like that, sort of nice things, but actually, normally when the mind is wandering, it's following habitual patterns of thought or behavior or emotion. And for most people, that involves a good bit of anxiety or irritability or sadness. And so if, if we simply allow our mind to wander and do whatever it wants, then more often than not, we spend sort of a little bit more time unhappy than we, than we need to. Which is, I mean, the, when we bring it to that science of um, historically, I think I've thought a little bit about meditation as being a little bit fluffy. It has that kind of, you know, that that stigma, but starting to look at this and the physiological backup to everything is where I think it's, it starts to change the game, you know, and, and even having seen the Dalai Lama recently, or I don't even sure if this was a recent quote, but I've just heard it recently. Um, say if every eight year old in the world is taught meditation, we will eliminate violence from the world in one generation. And I know you just launched Headspace for Kids. We did. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the age that kids can start and, and also just how does that work for kids? Yeah, so prior to, to developing Headspace for Kids, I'd, I'd gone into schools and, and, I, and I'd done stuff, but on a, on a very kind of casual basis as long as sort of 10 years ago. Um, with kids as as young as kind of six, seven, I think the youngest sort of class I ever worked with was about sort of five years old. And I had no experience of teaching children. So it was a case of going in there and finding out kind of what worked. And then over the years, Rich and I, uh, Rich, co-founder of Headspace, you know, we became increasingly passionate about making this available for kids. And and from our community as well, it was the most requested thing time and time again. So we teamed up with a, an NGO here in the US and we, we actually put together a, a formal sort of study program that we could put out in public schools here in LA and also up in Seattle. And we started to look at, you know, okay, so what does this look like when, when teachers, when children implement this on a daily basis in the classroom? And that was specifically for six to nine year olds. The way we've done it in the app, we've actually broken it down into to five and under, six to eight and nine to 11. And, and every, I think every age, you know, just the tone is a little bit different and maybe, especially for the younger ones, it feels a bit more playful in nature. And this is, this is wonderful. Do you envision curriculum kind of adopting this uh, more rapidly? And, and what has been your takeaway from actually implementing this in, in schools? It's been really, it's been really interesting. I think the the first thing was we our as part of the study our request was to, it was just a three minute exercise and there were there were a number of different choices. You know, some were focused more on on calming, some were more on focus, and um, and some were more on connection and sort of kindness. And our request to the to the schools that the teachers kind of did it once a day, three minutes once a day, and that was it. And then when we went into the schools, we found out that most of the teachers were doing it at least four or five times a day. Mm. And they were using it in transition. And, and you know, the feedback from teachers has always been, oh, look, the curriculum's already packed. You know, there's no room for anything else in the curriculum. And yet all of a sudden, you know, the teachers were finding space in the curriculum. And it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily that they were stealing time from math or English or, or the other subjects. It was more that, look, in transition from you know, whether it's from playtime to, to work time, whether it's from a creative exercise to a more sort of study focus based exercise. Very often the classroom, and I say this having worked as a teacher as well, kind of in a classroom, uh, there's often a lot of kind of um, agitation and, and movement. And, and actually, this is a great way at that length of time. It's a great way of transitioning from from one sort of thing to another. So we got quite excited about the idea of actually becoming um, part of the curriculum. And then we went to Washington and we spoke with sort of Department of Education and stuff. 
and we realized just how uh, complicated a system that that is to, to sort of get through. And whilst we, we have their support and we're continuing to work with them both on a research basis and on actually getting it into schools, in the meantime, we decided the best way, the, the quickest way of making it available to children was encouraging parents to, to sit down and do it with their, with their kids um, or making it freely available for teachers to use with their kids in classrooms, you know, off, off their own back to, to begin with. Gotcha. So you can just leapfrog the system and make it available. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I guess exactly. the ROI to the, for the teachers <laughs> and the parents is probably high enough that they'll adopt it without uh, it being enforced. But I can just, I, think so. <laughs> I can just imagine. You know, we. I remember, of course, as most people do, of course, saying the pledge of allegiance the first thing that you do in the morning at school, and then having you know meditation i remember thinking why don't we have to say the golden rule that would be i think really really but these these consistent behaviors and habits so early it makes it makes total sense um switching gears for a minute to exercise and meditation so i used to think that running jogging and or just a long walk was kind of my form of meditation but can you talk a little bit about the difference in the two yeah so i it's interesting. A lot of people say that here in here in California, especially a lot of people will say, oh, surfing's my my meditation or, yeah, when I go out running's my meditation. And and, and I get that, you know, I as, as someone who loves physical exercise, I know exactly what it is kind of you're talking about that that state of mind, that sense of flow when you just kind of forget everything else. And you're just in the moment kind of with that with that sport, with that activity. The problem with that, Amy Joe, is that. Uh, what happens when we don't have access to that? So, for example, I, I know people who, when there are no waves in town, like, they're actually quite moody for a couple of weeks. You know, they're not very happy um, because they, they, you know, they're dependent on on the waves for their sense of happiness. Or I know people who are dependent on running or swimming for their happiness, and then they get ill, or they maybe they get injured, and they're not able to do it. So there's a kind of a dependency thing. But more than that, I think. For most of us, when we when we get stressed in our, our life, it's often in situations kind of where it's not very convenient to just say to the person who we're chatting with or arguing with or the people around us at work or at home to say, oh, look, I'm feeling a little bit kind of agitated. I'm just going to go for a run or I'm just going to go for a, a swim so I can kind of calm down. You know, we actually want we want to know how to be able to do that in the moment without being dependent on another activity. So... Yes, meditation, there is a, a meditative quality to many activities. And, and I would encourage people all day long to kind of to, to pursue those and, and engage in those. But I do think there's real value in learning meditation alongside those things so that you can truly apply it to every single moment of the day. That makes a lot of sense. I think right now, it, the last 24 hours have been interesting for me in, in a similar way because I've the last couple of years, I've intentionally tried to simplify and and declutter my life, whether it's literally moving onto a boat. I took that pretty literally, and it, I'm an experiential learner, I guess. But I thought, okay, less things, less clutter, less distractions. Um, and maybe this has to do with working in technology for so long and being, you know, just really attached to my phone and computer, like most of us. Um, but I ended up even moving to the forest and, and this was a very intentional move. Um, and I feel like it's kind of going on the offensive, but I do travel a lot. And so I've spent about a month, which is a long time for me, um, not to travel to a big city. I've been traveling, but they've been to nature type areas, Canada, Idaho. And all of a sudden now I'm in a big city, which I'm very used to, but this juxtaposition, I found myself having to kind of adjust and uh, acclimate again to the busyness. And I've come back to my hotel room a couple of times and done headspace more than once in one day <laughs> because, which is not, usually it's just once a day for me. Um, and do you think that that's, that's something that, um, of course, with the amount of the pace and the amount of busyness that we all have, that the benefits are just amplified with meditation, it would seem, or? I, I think that's right. I, you know, there's, it's interesting, you know, a lot of people kind of say, you know, is, 
uh, is the the fascination in meditation at the moment due to due to the amount of you know digital chatter we have in our lives and uh, is is it just a fad kind of maybe it's I think look on the one hand we can look back and say look this has been around for a few thousand years and we're essentially dealing with kind of the the human condition you know and the, the mind our thoughts and emotions and the challenges of of living as a human being. Um, and in, in some ways, those haven't changed that much. But I do think the challenges are amplified because of the amount of stuff going on in our life. And I, and I do think technology, I do think the digital chatter has, has added to that in a huge way, you know. And so I, I think every, you know, pretty much everybody now is looking for that little slice of time where they can just really dis- disconnect in some way and step away from all of that. What I really kind of love and what I feel passionate about, you know, when it comes to meditation is not just its, its application when we're sitting there with, with our eyes closed. Cause in the same way you've, you've moved, you know, moved away to the, the forest and to the woods. And, <laughs> um, when, when I moved to the monastery, everybody was kind of like, oh yeah, but that's easy for you. You know, you, you can be relaxed, like sitting on top of a mountain, you know, that's, that's really nice. Good, good for you. You know, you wait and see what it's like when you, you know, when you live in the city and when you're a monk you're, or a nun, you know, you're always taught that, you don't meditate to learn how to sit still with your eyes closed like a statue. Like you learn to meditate so that you can apply it to every single moment of your day. So you can be mindful in everyday life. So the meditation is really just the training tool. You know, that's something that you, you step away from life and, and learn and you practice to be mindful. And then you, then you apply mindfulness to every day. So my hope is that people won't just see meditation as, as an escape, but rather as a way of training the mind so that it doesn't matter whether we're in the forest, on the top of a mountain, or in the middle of a really busy city with a hectic job, a family life, and everything else going on around us. But still, even then, we're able to apply this, this sense of being present, this, this idea of being mindful with a, a non-judgmental, a non-critical mind in each and every moment of our day. And and that, for me, is the, the potential and the essence of, of meditation. And going back for a moment to the time when you decided to become a monk. So that, that wasn't a why not now moment, or was it? <laughs> That's a pretty big one, Andy. <laughs> that, that was a big one. You know, it, it had been, um, it's not that meditation was completely new. I'd, I'd learned when I was really young. I learned with my mom when I was about sort of 10 or 11. And we'd grown up kind of exposed to some of that some of that stuff you know and um but I was actually I was doing a, a sports science degree at the time in the UK and it, I even now when I when I recall it I, it sounds strange to me too but um I was, I was definitely having kind of quite a, a tough time my mind was exceptionally busy I'd gone through a really difficult time at a I've been involved in a, in a, in a car accident where a few people had died kind of a few years before them. And it was kind of playing on my mind. It was, I'd never really kind of dealt with it. So I knew kind of underneath, I just felt a little bit kind of unhappy and I didn't really kind of have peace of mind. And, um, and one afternoon, you know, it really was, it happened like this (laughs) one afternoon. I just knew in that moment, I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't, made lists of pros and cons of becoming a Buddhist monk or anything like that. You know, I just, one afternoon, I just thought I have to do this. And I went into to university that afternoon and I told my, I told my lecturer that I was, I was leaving to become a monk. He told me I was mad. Uh, I should go and see the doctor, maybe get some Prozac or something. And, um, and I left and I, I worked for three months in a, in a restaurant to save up some, some money to fly out to India. Uh, and I, I flew, yeah, just before, just before Christmas, about three months after leaving university. So that afternoon, did, did something prompt you? I mean, it sounds like there had been a buildup and you'd been through some, some, uh, very rough kind of experiences and, and that had been playing on your mind. You said, but was it a moment that at that afternoon that hit you or some, you decided quickly? Yeah. So. Do you know, it was, um, it was one of those those things, and and when I say kind of you know like I decided instantly, it was it wasn't a it, there wasn't a conscious process of should I do this? Can I do this? How should I do this? It was just a, a really deep sense of gut feel of this is what I'm going to do, and it was like someone had just turned the light on. Like I really. I had no way of explaining it. I wasn't reading a book at the time. I remember sitting there and feeling, I felt quite emotional at the time. 
And I was I was at college and I was doing all the things you should do at college, you know, going out and having fun with friends and, and everything else. But there was just this feeling of not feeling, I don't know, completely fulfilled. But just knowing that sort of something was something was missing. And I don't know how in my mind that it, it led to, oh, okay, well, the logical conclusion is that you should go away and become a Buddhist monk because I, I realize that's not the logical conclusion for everybody in that moment. But there was just a sense of, you know, if, if I'm going to understand this, it's not going to be from a book. I, I'm not going to, you know, meditation, you know this, Amy Jo, from, from doing, doing, doing Headspace. It's, it is an experience and you can read about it and you can talk about it. But it's really only when you sit down and you do it that you, that you know it as an experience rather than just an idea. And, and that, was the, that was the feeling. It's something like if I'm going to ever understand my mind, I, I really need to sit with it. And having been exposed to that stuff in, in my teenage years, um, somehow <laughs> my, my mind kind of made a fairly big leap, I suppose, to, okay, well, let's, let's qu- quit university and, and go and be a monk. That's just, and, and that's fascinating, especially when you think about your upbringing and learning to meditate with your mom at such a young age. I wonder if it just helped you be in touch or in tune with your intuition at a really heightened level without maybe realizing it, maybe more so than than others. But it's pretty cool that you've been able to practice this um, kind of go on your gut, you know, totally act on your gut uh, feeling because it's it's obviously worked out quite well for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked out okay. I would I would say look, um, and and I think this is really important, and it, it does apply to meditation, but it applies to everyday life. Sometimes I think we we have a gut feeling. It doesn't mean an absence of thought. So so for me, I I can have a gut feeling that I I know it's the right, but still thoughts can arise in the mind of you know it might be a thought of of doubt or it might be a thought of worry or it might be a thought of you know concern whatever. But it's it's knowing that those are just thoughts, and 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 knowing that feeling in your in your gut or in your heart. So so you're so familiar with it that the thoughts kind of don't matter. You just know it's the right thing to do. So it's not an absence of, of thought or concern. It's just, it's just being in touch with that feeling, I think. That's what I'm trying to, to conquer and, and work toward more. That's totally my goal. And I've been on the focus pack and I'm almost done with that. And when, when you allow, well, in, so in the Headspace app, uh, there comes a point for for those for anyone who hasn't used it, who totally should try it. Um, you you get to that point where you let us let our minds wander. So you get to this point where you you give us permission, and my mind is kind of wandering, and I'm batting at thoughts before that, and then all of a sudden, when you when you give us that green light, yeah. <laughs> it's like this thing happens where it doesn't wander anymore. I know. What's it's happening brilliant. there, Andy? What are you doing? It's, it's, I can't wait for uh, that part. Every single time I'm like, I can't wait till he says, okay, let yeah. your mind wander. Cause then it'll go still. This was, this is one of my Tibetan teachers, um, a, a little kind of, I don't say trick, but kind of a little exercise he, he did with us one day. And, and we were sitting there and we, you know, he'd instruct us a lot in different types of meditation and things. And then one day he said, okay, just you know, stop what you're doing. And, and we were just kind of chatting. And he said, okay, for the next two minutes, I don't want you to meditate. And, and it's like the mind was so confused. It was like, what do you mean, don't meditate? Well, what am I supposed to do then? And, and it was almost as though in its, in its surprise and in its confusion, the, the mind was sort of suspended in thought. You know, like there was just there was kind of nothing. And the more he said, okay, look, I, you know, just, just allow your mind to do whatever it wants to do. If it wants to think, let it think. And it was really interesting. Most of the time, we're trying to control the process in our mind. And even when we meditate, you know, if we're focusing on the breath, there might be just a little too much kind of control coming into it. And so because of that, the mind feels a bit sort of contained. It's a bit like, uh, I don't know, uh, a horse being sort of pinned down or something like that. It, it starts to kick and shuffle around a little bit. But all of a sudden, if you say to that horse, kind of, you know, you put it on a really long rope and you put it in a big open field and you say, okay, you've got all the space you want. It's a pretty good chance the horse is just going to stand there eating, <laughs> eating the grass, you know, quite happy, just content to be where it is. And the mind's really quite, quite similar to that. You know, it's, um, there's something about giving it a lot of space where it feels quite comfortable. 
And most of the time in our life, the mind feels as though it's in a, a really kind of tight box. So that part of the exercise is really just to, to remind you and us that actually we don't need to try too hard. Actually, if we if we approach the mind in a very gentle way, then it, it naturally comes to to a place of ease quite quickly. Brilliant. And I love it. And well, to clarify too, so d- does one need to kind of meditate prior to that in order to get to a point to where you can then kind of trick it and confuse it? Because I was trying to do this yesterday by myself and I can't do it by myself as well. I'm preparing, preparing for this big talk and I, my mind's just kind of going a little bit crazy. And I think, well, maybe just let it do its thing and it doesn't work the same <laughs> as when <Yeah>. you do it. <laughs> it does over, over time. Over so time. With, okay. with, with real kind of, with real practice, I think to begin with, it is, it's almost the, the contrast between, okay, focusing, focusing and let it be free. Like it's almost like a, a rest for the mind. Over time, the more familiar you become with that feeling, the easier it becomes to apply even outside of of meditation. And in fact, the long term, if we can say there's any kind of goal in in meditation, I don't really like that word, but um, it's really about finding stability of of that in day to day life where the mind is free. We're not we're not walking around like, you know, robots, kind of you know, mindful robots very slowly and very sort of deliberately, but we're living our life in a very free and easy way, but with a sense of, you know, being, being present, being at ease, allowing the mind to, to think. The difference is we're not getting overwhelmed by thoughts. We're not buying into the thoughts. We don't believe we are the thoughts. So instead, we have a sense of freedom and a sense of ease that no matter what arises in the mind, it's just thought. And we can choose to engage with that that's helpful and useful, and we can choose to let go of that which is unhelpful. And that which hurts us or, or others around us. I'm going to follow, I'll follow up with you and, and keep trying this on my own. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. Um, we talked a little bit about meditation and exercise and I, I've been talking to a lot of friends and family about meditation because I've just started and I've seen the, the benefits over the last several few months. And sometimes I hear, you know, the whole, I'm exercising, that's my form of it. But also sometimes I hear people say, um, well, when I pray, that's my form of meditation. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so that's a really interesting one. I think that prayer, prayer and meditation, um, I think they can go hand in hand. Some people use the, the words interchangeably. I think they, they are a little different. It depends on the type of meditation and the type of prayer we're talking about because, of course, there are, there are so many different types. The way that I would look at it slightly differently is that very often prayer is, is kind of driven by a sense of, of intention. We're, we're engaging the, the intellect to a certain extent for most people when they pray. There's a, there's a thinking about kind of life and what's going on in life and, and perhaps asking for some, some help or support, whether for oneself or for others. Whereas in meditation, we're, we're not necessarily seeking to engage the, the cognitive aspect of, of the mind. It's more a case of, of stepping back and, and, and listening, also being, being present. So for those that pray with a sense of kind of simply listening, you know, just being present, and listening to, to whatever it is they relate to through their faith. In the same way, I think that that, that perhaps relates a bit more to meditation where we, we sim- simply sit and we're, we're not engaged in, in thinking of any kind at all. We're simply allowing the mind to, to be at rest. I do think, you know, one of the big, um, the big obstacles for many people in the past for, of meditation is that, you know, it, it's it, in the tradition, it's been so tied up in, in, kind of uh, traditions of faith and perhaps there are some cultural things as well. But I would say to anyone, you know, meditation is defined by how you choose to use it. So for some people, it might be about bringing it into their faith, into their spiritual practice, whatever, whatever that is. But for other people, you know, we have mums and dads who are using it at home to, to help with, with the, the, the chaos of having kids in the house. And equally, we have kids who are using it to cope with their stressed out parents. You know, we have professional, we have professional athletes who, who use it kind of on their own and as part of teams. Um, and there are large corporations that use it to help with kind of productivity and focus in the workplace. The, the truth is there are, there are so many different ways you can apply meditation, but ultimately it's up to you as, a, as an individual how you, 
how you kind of apply that that skill to your life. Yeah, that was kind of my next my next question for you was just the connotation and the sometimes stigma around certain words and how we can get so hung up, but the, the benefit and how and what we decide to call it or how we describe it, it really is not the point of this. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's a really tricky one, you know. In, mm-hmm. in some ways, as, as soon as we talk about meditation, we we move further away from mm-hmm. it, like mm-hmm. the, the 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 essence of it. And one of my we we have a program here called called Get Some Give Some. So when when you buy a subscription, it means that it releases one. We we make another subscription available for someone who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it or have access to it. And as a result of that, we've we've worked with we work with prisons and schools and NGOs and all kinds of different people around around the world, different organisations. And one of my favourite stories is when and it's, it's happened multiple times, is where you've had, in countries where there's been conflict, and we've we've had this from the Middle East, where it's been Palestinians and Israelis sitting down together. We've had it uh, from countries in Africa, um, where there have been different kind of warring tribes, where people have, who have had conflict have sat down in meditation. And in the silence of meditation, they're united. As soon as we, as soon as we stop using kind of words, like words are so helpful in, in many ways, but they can equally be very kind of divisive. And what, one of my loves about meditation is that, yeah, when we, when we sit down and meditate, we're, we're all in the same place. We're all just experiencing the human condition as it is in that moment. And nothing else exists. There are no opinions that are right or wrong. There is no good or bad. There is no me and you. There is just a, us in this moment right now. And, and I do think that's one of, yeah, one of the... Maybe one aspect of meditation that's not often kind of focused on, but offers a huge amount of potential for for peace in the world, actually. So powerful. So, so powerful. So I've noticed a lot of the uh, Olympians have been using Headspace. Is that a similar um, kind of process? Are they using the app in the same way that kind of the standard everyday non-Olympian <laughs> would use it? <laughs> well, I- this is what this is one of my favorite kind of journeys within within Headspace, and it's happened so organically. It actually happened prior to to 2012 in in London, and and we noticed somebody uh, who kept coming back. So we used to do events before we did before we had the app. Um, we used to run events, and they're either weekly or monthly in London. And and so this girl kind of this woman kept coming back, and then eventually she came up. To, to speak and she said oh, I'm a, a sports psychologist um, I work with the you know with the British a lot of British Olympians and um, with the team and um, you know I'm, I'd love to kind of use this with with some of our athletes you know what would you recommend so we got kind of chatting and the app I think came out about probably about I don't know six months before the before the Olympics and they started using them and they got some fantastic results so off the back of that they said, okay, you know, look, how about we kind of work together to make this available to, to all of the all of the athletes? Wonderful. So we spent we spent a good few years kind of learning what the needs of professional athletes are, and they are a little bit different, but ultimately mine's mine. So we're still talking about the, the same themes. And we put together a whole range of sport content. Um, up to up to now, or just recently, you know, it's only been available for professional athletes. But it's yeah, we're we're making it available um, for everybody, so that everybody can learn how to be more. Whether it's having greater intention and motivation in training, whether it's about learning how to find calm and focus at competition time, how to better uh, rest between training periods, or how to recover and rehabilitate after accident or injury. But making sure that everybody has. The, the tools they need to apply it to the sports and the activities they, they love in their life. That's wonderful, the, the kind of customization aspect and, and getting really in tune with being able to fit the needs of the person using, you know, the, the app for what it is that they can they can accomplish or do next. And that's, that's really interesting. I'm excited to check that out too. And um, if, we, if we talk about the why not now of the future for you. You did mention that there are some things you've been thinking about, or at least that came to mind um, for the future. What are those things? What what can we do to help you get your why not now on? 
<laughs> well, you, you said no matter how big, how small. And I think about six months ago, um, we we moved we moved home. We moved our offices. We grew out of our offices, and we, we got some new offices in Santa Monica. And, and and I moved home with my wife and and our our baby son. And um, I think together. So I've I've been you know headspace. Uh, there's a lot of us here, and it requires quite a lot of a lot of time and and effort and. Uh, my wife's been quite caught up with, with with our son, and so we. Although we we have what we need in our house, I it would be generous to say that our house was furnished. You know, like we <laughs> we're both just not that bothered about stuff. Mm-hmm. So what tends to happen, and this is a repeating cycle, whenever we move somewhere, unless it happens within the first week or two, it's probably not going to happen, <laughs> or or not at least for a couple of years. So people walk into our into our house and they're like, "Oh, have you just moved in?" And we're like. Well, yeah, about six six months ago, actually. <laughs> They're like, but there's nothing in your living room. Like, what's going on? They're like, yeah, our son likes it. He runs around, you know. <laughs> but de- definitely to to furnish to furnish our house, or at the very least, to get some pictures on the wall and that kind of thing is has been on my mind. It's been on your mind, and so the that sounds like a fairly doable type of thing. What would be the first step in making that happen? Yeah, so um, <laughs> is it time? I think, is it bringing yeah, someone think, else to do it? Or? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I can come and help you hang <laughs> some fine. things on the wall. <laughs> do you have a step ladder you can come around with? Um, yeah, I think uh, it, it, it's a time. It's a time thing, and what typically what happens is like you know anyone with with kids will will know this thing you know sort of one of you go out to work, and by the time you come home, you know you do bath time and put put little ones down to, to bed and everything else and, and then you just want to kind of hang out together you don't want to start mm-hmm. kind of going online and finding furniture and stuff so I think it's it's committing some time ourselves or finding someone else to come in and and perhaps assist us in moving things <laughs> along and maybe yeah maybe it's a bit of a Trojan horse thing where you make it more uh, stimulating and fun than it might seem. So maybe there's some really cool photos that are on your phone that you could get printed uh, or something that's just going to make it a little bit more attractive than digging online. And, um, you know, maybe it's art, maybe you paint (laughs) or something and you're thinking, I have no time, let alone to paint, but um, you never know. I think sometimes trying to get creative with the solutions allow us to be more into them. But that's I can I can totally relate. You know, having just <laughs> moved, and and I'm thinking, when are those certain crates that I've put in the closet so I can't see them? Um, but I do go to them, and I know what's in them. So if I can get some certain things out, and I need them, I can go there. But um, it's just priorities, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and funny, like your your mind went to the exact same place. We 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 sat down at the weekend, so our, our little one was was two at the weekend. Oh, and, congratulations! Um, <laughs> and uh, and we sat down. We're like, okay, look, this, this just isn't happening, is it? You know, this this kind of whole house thing, and um and so we we came to the same conclusion. Like, you know, what what would make it feel like home? And we said, well, you know, pictures of rather than kind of shopping for art, you know, it's pictures of the people that we love. And so we actually went onto our phones and we we did we picked out ten ten photos of of our son that that we love from the last two years. And and my wife this week, I you know I I say this confidently. She she promised me that this week she's going to get those printed off i'm going to get some frames and we're going to try try and hang them on the walls <laughs> it will be you it will just totally change the environment and the ambiance it's amazing how that works but it will feel different and yeah absolutely i i can i can relate i mean just find, looking for rugs the other night my husband's like i really don't care amy joe i like anything you want i don't care and i'm like well i don't i don't really either so what do we do <laughs> two hours go by and i'm like this was such a massive waste of time <laughs> but it, it did get done and when they showed up from amazon it was it was a happy moment so. Oh, good. so okay well that's good i'll have to check back in and uh and see how you're coming along that's a it's very doable, but yeah. at the same time. Hold us accountable, Amy Jo. Yeah. Check, check back in. Okay. <laughs> it's funny the the juxtaposition of the big things you can just conquer and do, and it's the smaller. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's <know>. different. <laughs> like just put, <laughs> These ones we can, we can tackle. Um, it's true. 
So a few few questions that I ask everyone at the end. They're kind of rapid fire. Um, what are you reading right now? Am I reading? Um, I'm well. I, the the thing I was reading last night before I went to bed was called the Surfer's Journal, which is um, it it comes out every two months, and it's not it's not a magazine. It's it's so much more than that. It's a it's a be- they're beautifully told stories and beautiful art and photography in there. It feels like a really precious kind of book, and but the the stories in there. It's not really about surfing. It's about the the people who surf. Very cool. I'll have to fill my husband in on that. He's from Australia and he's a big surfer. Okay. Um, and I think that that would be very appealing to him. What right. keeps you up at night? Uh, other than our son, um, <laughs> not very much. In fact, my wife complains that I go to sleep too quickly. You know, I, I basically get into bed and I'm like, good night. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I fall asleep really easily, but we, we get up really early with our with our little one. So so not not too much is the truth. That's a good thing. That's great. Pirates or ninjas? Who's tougher? Ninjas, I think. Okay. Do you have any rationale for that? Um, none whatsoever. Okay, uh, that's okay. <laughs> I think it's uh, I think growing up watching lots of kung fu movies and and things like that. I just uh, as as a yeah as a kid, I think I I probably aspired more to being a ninja than I did a a, a one legged pirate. No, too funny, and. What advice would you give to your younger self? And let's say that 22-year-old, right around the time that you went to uh, make some pretty big changes. Yeah, ne- I, I would just say never never doubt that feeling when you know you know. That's good. That's very good. Thank you so much, Andy, for joining us and hearing you live. It's just so cool. <laughs> it's a pleasure. No, thanks again for having me on, Amy Jo. It's really, really fun chatting. You bet. Well, we'll have you on again. So thank you. Andy is pretty inspiring. If you want to go to Headspace and get a free trial, go to headspace.com forward slash why not now. So we're a couple of months in here with the why not now show. And I want to hear from you. What do you like? What don't you like? Let me know on social media or email me at why not now at amyjomartin.com. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now?